on uh, our lung itself and try to show that concept of um, hysteresis, the ho inhomogeneity or the lack of uniformity of atelectasis in the lung and the way the lung recruits in a segmental way. Um, but before that, I was asked by um, GE to talk about non-invasive ventilation. So um, I'll kind of cover a few topics here because I always find talks on non-invasive ventilation, I don't quite know what to talk about for an hour. Um, but then when you think about it, you suddenly think actually there's quite a few things to talk about. For those of you who were at the hospital yesterday, I will cover some of the slides that I showed there, so I apologise for repetition. Um, I'm just going to remind us, maybe more as a discussion around, for discussion around how CPAP and non-invasive ventilation works. We'll talk about some of the different approaches. I'll come back to an area that's deep to my heart, which is CPAP level. Um, and I'll think another thing that I've been thinking about a fair bit over the last couple of years is work of breathing, which I think is an under-recognised uh, component of non-invasive ventilation that people don't think about. And I'll talk a little bit about CPAP in the delivery room because um, that's where our research and trial focus is at the moment. Um, before that, I'm just going to do a little rehash on lung protective ventilation because at the end of the day, that's why we're not intubating babies, right? Because we think that it's um, injurious and we want to keep them on non-invasive. Um, and I just, again, I apologise for those who've seen these slides, just reminding you all that we don't just treat HMD. We have a different raise, a different um, uh, spectrum of pathologies that we see in the NICU. We do see HMD, um, but we also see other conditions. When I think about a baby, I do think, yes, what's the diagnosis? But I actually try to categorise them around what's going on in their lungs, not necessarily the diagnosis. So do they have gas trapping? Do they have a hyperplastic undergrowth lung? Do they have atelectasis? Or do they have the more complicated mixed disease, which we often actually see? And I think because I think, like, I, I gather in India you do see quite a lot of term lung disease, which we see as well in our unit. they actually quite complicated to manage at times. And it really just comes back to that concept that there's not going to be one single algorithm that will work for every patient um, and that you as a senior clinician need to be able to direct your staff down the right pathway rather than just assume that they do the same thing every time it'll work. So um, I always remind myself that all modes of respiratory support cause lung injury. So and there's no mode of respiratory support we will ever be able to provide that will not cause lung injury because they're all artificial. They're applying something artificial to lungs. So therefore, lung protective ventilation is not about preventing all lung injury. It's really around minimising lung injury, but at, not at the expense of um, compromising why they're on the respiratory support to start with, which is because they have a problem of oxygenation or CO2 clearance. So for me, lung protective ventilation is optimising oxygenation and ventilation using the least amount of injury. But I'm not going to... But if, if, I, if there's no point saying, well, I've prevented all lung injury, but the patient's so hypoxic that they're going to die um, is, is sort of a useful way of pressure. And we all know that we use permissive hypercapnia, and we all know why, um, and we all work on the premise that now, ideally, we should not be on an intubated modality if we can help it. And I don't think that's a, a, something that we need to be changing or, cha or discussing further. There's a lot of logic behind that. Um, again, as I showed uh, yesterday, um, and I use this slide a lot, um, because when we think about lung injury and lung protective ventilation, our challenge is that it's not one or the other. It's sort of putting the thread through the needle because if we go too far in one direction with our settings, we will cause lung injury. If we go too far the other way in our settings, we'll cause lung injury. If we try to avoid volutrauma and barotrauma too much, we make the lung atelectatic. If we try to avoid atelectasis too much, we make the lung overdistended. So we actually have to find this narrow course for a healthy lung, the hazards are far apart, so it's quite easy. But for a diseased lung, the states which cause atelectasis and volutrauma barotrauma are actually quite close together. So it makes it particularly complicated to find our way, and that's the problem that our patients have that we need to be aware of. 
The concept of a lung protective strategy that we hear in adult intensive care, neonatal intensive care and paediatric intensive care, which is a high PEEP, I would probably turn that to say the phrase adequate PEEP or appropriate PEEP and a low tidal volume and fast rate you can see comes around because in this slide that a low tidal volume will avoid barrow trauma and volume trauma. But if you have a low tidal volume, you need a faster rate to clear CO2. And PEEP will reduce atelectasis. So that's where it comes from. We're trying to balance our way between here. We also have to be aware that when it comes to lung injury, it's not just volume trauma, barrow trauma and atelectasis. There's the injury related to oxygenation itself, so oxidative injury. There's an injury related to the biological response to the lung, whether that's a, a microbial one or whether it's related to other um, biological factors. And then there's this factor which is called mechanico-transductive lung injury, which is fantastic. It sounds really good. It sounds so good the government funded us when we put grants in because it sounds good. Um, but what basically that is actually a real form of lung injury. And that's because, and I think we forget about this, because we talk about volume trauma and we talk about a lung, you know, four mil, five mil, six mil per kilo. We forget the lungs doing this all the time. So volume trauma and atelectotrauma don't consider the injury related to motion. You know, you have a car and you that's always, you've got moving parts and with time they wear out. If you have a racing car and you really drive really, really fast, it wears out quicker. So there is this component of injury related to motion as well, which I think is under-recognised and probably because we really don't quite yet know how to measure it, but I think we're starting to understand it. And part of motion is how you work with the thing that's helping you, which is the ventilator. So asynchrony in itself is almost certainly an injurious process. And we've definitely, we haven't published it yet, we've just finished a study in lambs looking at lambs who are kept apneic on lung protective ventilation, who are on fully synchronised lung protective ventilation, where we've worked on the right PEEP and the right total volume and all these other factors, and then lambs where we've intentionally made them asynchronous. These are preterm lambs. It's very hard to actually make a baby intentionally always asynchronous because they try to synchronise. It's very annoying. <laughs> um, but we may, we've got a population that asynchronous, and that group of asynchronous lambs have way more lung injury even when we use a low tidal volume and adequate PEEP and all that compared to the other groups. So I think asynchrony is really quite important and under-recognised. The lungs are an organ of motion, as I just said. So we have two things we want to do, ventilate and oxygenate them, and we also need to diffuse and perfuse. But diffusion is generally fairly normal in a newly born uh, baby. It <laughs> becomes a problem in a baby of chronic lung disease. Um, and to oxygenate, we need adequate recruitment. So that's PEEP, PIP and TI on a conventional ventilator or amino acid pressure on the oscillator and RFO2. And CO2 clearance is generated by minute ventilation, which is rate times tidal volume. Um, and so we can initiate changes in both using a number of settings, but predominantly delta P and our, our rate. Um, we need to know that it's not just the pressure. We need to give the lung enough time to inflate and enough time to deflate. So you get your tidal volume in and you get your tidal volume out. So CO2 clearance is normal. And we give the lung enough pressure to move. And I think as I've showed yesterday, it's important just to remind ourselves about this physiology we did in medical school, that when we breathe, we are initiating a pressure difference in the lung. So that's a negative pressure for you and I right now. On a ventilator, it's a positive pressure. And if you're on NIPBV, it's still a positive pressure you're giving to the lung, but you're initiating a mixed pressure change of negative and positive pressure in the lung. We're giving a gas flow to generate that pressure. The pressure doesn't magically appear. You have to push that in with a flow of gas. And we need to make sure that pressure difference is given over enough time to cause the lung to move or enough time to allow the lung to deflate. Um, and it's through that pressure difference with a flow of gas with adequate time that you actually get our tidal volume to change and that the pressure difference needs to be big enough to overcome the forces which are stopping the lung from moving because the lung wants to stay deflated that's its natural state it's like a big spring so we need to have enough pressure to overcome resistance in the lung which is what our airways are like so smaller longer airways need more pressure um, and 
to overcome the elastic recoil of the lung. The inverse of that, of course, is compliance. So compliance is delta V over delta P, or tidal volume divided by delta P on a conventional ventilator. And um, a poorly compliant lung needs a lot of pressure for a small amount of volume change. So we need to overcome those two forces. We don't need to give any more pressure than the, that's required, but it's very hard to understand that without um, fancy measurements, which we don't have. So that's sort of the way, uh, that's sort of my very brief summary of just reminding us what the basics of lung mechanics and also what lung protection is. And then when we come to think about how we've deli delivered lung protection in the NICU and we look at the meta-analyses of the trials, we know that non-invasive uh, non ventilation in clinical trials reduces BPD in rates of, uh, and, um, better and has better outcomes. And hence, that's why we all do it. It is also easier to do. It's easier to nurse and it's more cost effective. So there's a lot of reasons, but essentially it reduces BPD. And we, of course, know that surfactant does the same. Um, it reduces it reduces short-term measures. It doesn't necessarily reduce BPD. Um, surfactant with non-invasive ventilation, we're now seeing more and more trials that are showing that there's a potential benefit. Um, and the Optimus trial, which has come out, has shown, I don't know if you saw that a few weeks ago it was published, the long-term, the two-year data, showed better respiratory outcomes at two years when surfactant was given with non-invasive ventilation versus non-invasive alone, and that was using without insure. Um, and we'll talk about oxygen targets a little bit later. Again, this is all very basic knowledge for you all, I'm sure, but just to, to help you so when you're translating and talking to your trainees, um, what is CPAP? It's, um, it doesn't have an impact just on the lungs. Its clinical impact is through the entire respiratory tree. We talk a lot about CPAP and lung volume, but for many of our babies, I actually think the benefit of CPAP is not in FRC and lung volume, it's in the other impact it has on you because it's, it's providing a constant applied pressure to the respiratory system, not the lung, the respiratory system, during normal negative pressure ventilation. So firstly, it improves pharyngeal tone. For many of our babies, there's a problem of pharyngeal tone. And if you want to see where CPAP really works on pharyngeal tone, take a baby with Pierrot Ben syndrome and put them on CPAP and see how much better they are. They've got normal lungs and a normal upper air, a lower airway. So it must be the pharyngeal tone you're improving there. It um, washes gas out of your upper airway, so it improves your, um, your dead space gas washout. I think for many preterm babies, it stimulates them. And definitely we've been looking at this in our LAM data. It very much stimulates them to breathe, being on non NIPPV, even if they don't get um, volume, much pressure and volume change. It splints airways open, so we've got a whole lot of effect on the upper part of the respiratory system. And then, yes, it does support end expiratory lung volume and FRC, and I'll show that, but not in all babies. And it probably improves diaphragmatic efficiency and probably, unless it's too excessive, may actually reduce the effect of diaphragmatic wasting, which happens when you're on a conventional ventilator and an oscillator, and preterm babies potentially os diaphragm waste pretty quickly. So we need to just remember that because it may be that we're not using CPAP for lung volume gas exchange. We're trying to improve something else, and that, that, that that's really the primary modality. We now have lots of them on the market. Um, I cannot in any way say that I'm an expert on all of these. Um, most of them are delivering either, they essentially are delivering a continuous flow or a variable flow in most cases. So many of the ventilator derived CPAP systems are delivering a constant flow with the ex using an exhalation valve that is opened or closed to maintain a constant pressure. Um, and then you also have ones which would deliver a variable flow that are on the market. Um, probably, I don't think there's a huge practical difference in these because I actually think the benefit of CPAP, getting CPAP right is probably more about the right interface, the right fit, and then the right CPAP uh, pressure for the disease that you're managing. Um, and of course, we do have bubble CPAP as well, which is essentially a standalone system, which is really quite interesting because it generates a multi-frequency wave. And there's lots of data on that. We don't have big clinical trial data, but there's a benefit potentially in that multi-frequency wave of CO2 washout. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. I think what's more important is the patient interface. Um, they're all designed to have a leak. That's critical. 
unlike high flow, that leak is probably more important. Um, high flow, you want a very, very large leak. On CPAP, you want generally a smaller leak. But you then come at the problem of potentially getting skin contact issues. You have different systems. Um, we still actually use a single prong in our unit quite a lot. We're probably the last one in the world. Um, we tend to find that for the larger babies, they actually tolerate it quite well and they prefer it than the short binasal prongs. And because we have a lot of upper airway referrals from Southern Australia, they come to us for ENT cases, tend to find the single prong is much better when you've got upper airway structural problems um, because you're often trying to overcome some lesion somewhere in the airway. Um, but most of us, I think, are using either the short binasal prong or the modified prong mask. And that's, that's in our unit, that's the one we use the most is the modified prong mask. We use the fisher Paykel flexi trunk um, for most of our babies who are preterm. And again, probably because it's a New Zealand company and we're Australian, we tend to just buy the fisher Paykel stuff. I don't know if there's any benefit or not. It's just they're easy to get. Um, but obviously most of the data in the literature is based on short binasal prongs, which, are, which both of those systems offer less resistance than a single prong system, particularly in small babies. And there's catheter systems around, which I don't have much experience on clinically myself, like the RAM catheter, because we don't use them in Australia. But at least looking at the literature from America, I do have some concerns around the use of the RAM cannula in severe lung disease. Um, because they clearly are not generating the same pressure that a short binasal prong can do in the in in the upper airways but that's they obviously are being used a lot and they clearly work for many babies um, um <clears throat> what's also more important is just to remember and it won't be relevant for your unit like yours but in smaller units particularly in sort of country towns and australian stuff just reminding everyone you have to humidify your gas <laughs> so um what about setting the CPAP level? So we get the right prongs, we've got the right fit, we've minimised the leak, we've um, minimised the rub on the airway if we decide to use short binasal prongs or a mask. We've got nursing staff who know how to switch them over. Um, we've decided on our circuit we're going to use. How do you then set the CPAP level? Well, the answer is we have no idea um, because the Cochrane analysis says we have very, very small data from very small trials generally all of poor quality. There's no large trial that has said, let's compare five versus seven. And you'll go to one unit who they'll say, there's no way I'd ever use any pressure except five to six, because anything above that in a 26 weeker is dangerous. And then in Victoria, in Melbourne, I can drive six kilometers up the road and they'll go to another unit who will say, anyone who uses a CPAP pressure below eight clearly doesn't know what they're doing. So, and I think that's probably universal, right? If you generally, if you get 25 neonatologists in a room and I asked you what CPAP pressure to use, I will get 40 different answers and you, none of us will agree. And that's because probably there isn't one right pressure. Um, so if you look at the meta-analysis, you can see here that it shows that um, using some CPAP after birth um, or a higher CPAP level compared to a low CPAP level has virtually no difference on outcomes. But the confidence was so wide, the number of babies are very, very small. So, and the other part of the problem is what is the level being used for? We don't, unlike conventional and high frequency, where we tend to use it for a specific problem, which is severe acute respiratory failure or severe neurological impairment, um, we are using CPAP now for many different things. We may be using it in the delivery room to stabilise a baby during birth transition. We may be using it as first intention treatment for HMD, where 20 years ago that have all been intubated. So we're using it for acute lung disease. But then we're also using it as a step down from conventional ventilation in recovery phase of lung disease. And then we're sometimes using it for long-term therapy as part of a growth strategy. I mean, I think many of us probably work in units now where they'll say, I want to keep this baby on high flow because I want them to grow better despite the fact there's no real evidence that that happens, um, we tend to do that quite a lot. So we've, you're going to use CPAP levels are going to vary depending on the disease use. So in acute lung disease, we have very little data. For acute RDS, we have no good data. Following extubation, um, if you look here, um, you can see here, again, we have very, very wide confidence intervals on difference on the use of um, CPAP levels for extubation. And... If you again go back to the uh, most recent 
European RDS consensus statement, all it says is CPAP pressures are traditionally set between five and nine centimetres of water. That is it. If you go, and as some of you heard yesterday, I'm going to talk about delivery room in a minute. Um, if you go to ILCOR, which is meant to be the Bible of what's important in neonatal resuscitation, they took out the CPAP pressures out of the last two ILCOR statements. And they now say you should probably use CPAP, but don't say anything about pressure. Before that, they did have a statement about how we needed more evidence on pressure. Um, so ILCOR doesn't tell us either what to use in the delirium. So we're really working blind um, here. Um, do CPAP levels matter? Whenever I talk about this, someone says, what about COIN? Because I think every neonatologist knows about the COIN trial, at least every neonatologist that's not currently a junior doctor. And if you're not don't know about the COIN trial, it is actually worth reading this trial. I think um, as a trainee, you should go speak to your senior colleagues and say, I want the 20 most important neonatal papers that were published in the last 50 years. And, you know, go back and look at the Silverman papers on oxygen and blindness from the, 50, the you know, the 60s and 70s and all of those. And I think COIN probably comes up in it. I think, you know, I think many of us would say we would add the kangaroo care paper that came out from India a few years ago. That's probably now, I think we all agree, the best neonatal randomised control trial that was ever done. Um, so um, um, this one is worth looking at because... I was involved as a fellow in this, so I've recruited babies in this trial, but this was a trial comparing first intention CPAP to elective intubation, and it occurred about the same time as the support trial, which was a similar trial. Um, and they used, allowed the CPAP to be increased to about eight to 10 centimetres of water before it was deemed CPAP failure. There was no surfactant in the CPAP arm until after you're intubated, so often days after, but the conventional arm got CPAP, uh, surfactant. And there was no difference in BPD between the two. That was the primary outcome. So that actually tells you quite a lot, that non-invasive ventilation without surfactant gave the same outcome as intubation with surfactant, which probably tells you there's a benefit of a CPAP. Um, but there was a much higher pneumothorax rate. And at least in Australia, that air leak rate is fairly constant outside of the trial. So we've got rates over 10% of babies on first intention CPAP. Some units report air leak of any type of 20% as standard, as many of you know. And many people have come back and said, well, that shows that a high CPAP level is dangerous. But the subgroup analysis of that trial showed that the air leak was not related to the maximum pressure the baby got. So I think it's a misinterpretation and in this trial, there was no rigour on what CPAP level was being provided. So the clinician could pick within the range and it wasn't well structurally designed in the protocol. So we don't know if some of these babies were getting too little when they got an air leak or too much. And I think both could cause an egg. So it's been a good trial and a bad trial. Um, Risha Batia, who was one of our fellows probably when you were there, Kieran, um, and is now a consultant at Monash in Melbourne, um, she did her PhD looking at CPAP levels, and this is some of her data. She measured end expiratory lung volume in, in a, a group of 20 babies with acute RDS in the first 18 hours of life. And in 20 centimetre, uh, 20 minute steps, she took them from five to six to eight to 10 centimetres of water and measured their lung volume and was able to show that their lung volume increased within in, each increase in mean airway uh, in CPAP pressure, suggesting that the higher pressure was recruiting the lung. And then she took their CPAP levels down to six again in steps. And you can see there she was mapping a pressure volume curve. And she could see that for many of the babies, the lung volume, so for 50% of the babies, the lung volume at 10 was the same as the lung volume at eight when they came back down, suggesting that those babies had recruitable lungs, but also you could then drop the PEEP down on CPAP and still have the same benefit. For the other 50% of babies, there was no difference. Uh, so the CPAP, the lung volume dropped when she came down from 10, telling us that those babies probably needed a higher PEEP. So that suggests that there's likely to be a range of PEEP levels in this first few hours, after, first the day or so after birth, and that probably using a, a different range of PEEPs or having allowing a range of PEEPs is something we should think about. And as you, there is also a protocol that's published, but they haven't finished recruiting, called the Optimist. I don't quite know how to say that. It's a German trial 
which is comparing CPAP 6 to 8 versus 3 to 5 in the first few days after birth and looking at CPAP failure. They're only after 200 babies and they've been recruiting a few years, but I don't know where they are. But I, I think probably at least in most of the English speaking world, CPAPs of three to five are probably lower than many of us would use. You know, in the 1990s, that was normal, but I think many of us now would be using five as our lower threshold. And the question is really six, seven, eight, nine, ten is where the discussion comes, I think, between units. Um, <clears throat> Those studies are using CPAP levels for first intention acute lung disease, where you would expect you need a higher CPAP than you would for vent extubation. Um, we do know, though, that when you extubate a baby, you get quite a lot of lung volume loss. So again, Risha has done a number of studies looking at what happens to babies when we extubate them and showing that there is a significant drop in FRC and heterogeneity volume after you extubate from conventional in babies who are very much ready to be extubated, so they're not unstable in any way. And because of that, there's a rationale, of course, that maybe we should be using more PEEP in babies whose lung volumes are dropping after you extubate them, because we might be taking them from a mean airway pressure on conventional of 10, 11 or 12, and then putting them on a CPAP of six, which is presumably creating a mean airway pressure lower than that. So. Um, there is a number of small trials, so um, I'm sorry I put the wrong in on for the first one there, but there's a number of small trials of under 100 babies, um, one which showed no difference, extubating babies between um, six, up to six and up to nine, and one showing less extubation failure of seven to nine versus four to six. Again, from Risha's work, this I gather she told me that just before I left, this has now been accepted in um, Lancet Child Health, this study, which is the LCAT study. I can't pronounce it in French, but it clap. Um, which try, attempted to randomise 200 babies who were less than 28 weeks to a CPAP of 5 to 8 or a CPAP of 9 to 11 on extubation for 24 hours, and then it was clinical discretion. But they were encouraged to stay on their, the le level they were allocated to. They only randomised 139, which is really the biggest problem with this study, that it's underpowered. Um, so... Um, and they defined outcome as extubation failure at seven days. They found that um, overall there was a reduction in CPAP failure of uh, more than 10% using the higher CPAP level um, with a, um, a significant difference in that. Um, the CPAP failure, if I recall, I haven't read the paper, I've just seen them present this. Um, the CPAP failure, if I recall, was actually late, not early. Um, and may not, so it's, it's questionable as to what was the cause of why they were failing late. Um, but, and there was no difference in the really small babies. So they were failing anyway. Um, and it's unclear, I don't know if we're gonna be able to work out from this trial with the power they've got, whether the CPAP failure was a re result of apnea or a result of um, C, um, uh, respiratory distress. Um, which I think are very different causes for CPAP failure. So, but this will be an interesting paper to read when it comes out. I personally don't think it's enough to change practice, but again, my practice is already to use quite high CPAP levels in babies when I'm extubating, or at least not every baby, but not to feel uncomfortable putting a baby at eight to 10. Um, but I don't do that as for every baby. Um, I, I'd be interested to see how this is received. I know there's one unit in Victoria that's saying they're gonna change practice based on this, but I wouldn't on a study of 140 babies. But anyway, it shows that at least it was well tolerated. And I think when they pull with the other two trials, they will probably see a slight difference in CPAP failure and improvement, but I think more importantly, they won't see an increase in air leak, which hopefully will make people feel reassured. When you're on CPAP, you're breathing. So worker breathing is an important part of it, which I think is more important on non-invasive than invasive to a certain extent. So worker breathing is telling us about the work that we as an organism need to generate to overcome the resistance that's occurring within our respiratory system, which is with the tissues of our body and the lung, within the airways and within compressible intrathoracic gas, because gas is a compressible entity, um, when we're, and especially when we're breathing. So we first need to generate enough energy to overcome that resistance. We need to generate enough energy to deform the elastic tissue in our chest, so overcome the chest wall recoil and the lung recoil so that we allow the lung to engage in tidal ventilation, um, which means that there is an increased work of breathing to breathe in, but obviously that recoil becomes beneficial in expiration where we get an energy transfer back again to, um, to the, uh, to the um, 
uh, the respiratory system. So um, <clears throat> if you generate enough energy within your system to deform your elastic tissue and overcome resistance, then that potential energy is stored and can be used again to make expiration more efficient. Um, and having that stored potential energy means that we get minimum, we minimise our active muscular contraction and that we'll get minimal in on volume from, um, from the, and we have to remember that in neonates, we're not using the ribs as a way of generating tidal ventilation. It's nearly always diaphragmatic. So in babies, we know less about work of breathing than in virtually all other age groups. Um, we do know that in studies of babies with acute bron or infants with acute bronchiolitis, um, CPAP decreases um, uh, respiratory muscle overload um, and makes the work associated with the acute respiratory problems of bronchiolitis easier, which is why we use CPAP so often and high flow. And I think most of you probably know about the Paris trial, which compared first intention high flow versus no, just normal oxygen to prevent ICU admission, so it's not an ICU therapy, it was a general med therapy, and showed a reduction in ICU admission using high flow, but obviously in the ICU, high flow doesn't confer a benefit over, um, over CPAP alone, and many of us will use the two based on step up, I think. Um, in preterm infants, all of the trials which I've listed at the bottom there, which I'm happy to share with people, are all really small trials of crossover trials and really have looked at different things like variable flow versus continuing flow and suggest with variable flow there's less work of breathing um, and compared variable flow with bubble, which suggests that bubble CPAP has less resistive work of breathing. Um, but they're all very, very different. Um, and They're all very small and they really don't help answer the question. And I think probably the trial that does help the most that at least tells us that work of breathing, imposed work of breathing from a circuit in non-invasive ventilation may be an important clinical component is this trial um, which was published a couple of years ago in JAMA PEDS, which is the Corsard trial, which recruited about 250 babies in the delivery room uh, in Europe and randomised them to either mask support in the delivery room using a near puff, which is what most of us do, using a CPAP um, and then positive pressure ventilation if they needed it, versus this uh, RPAP device which um, is basically a short binasal prong system, um, which, but has the facility to give positive pressure support using a hand device attached to it. So like a, a near puff with a different circuit, as opposed to just being on a CPAP circuit. There is some work just out of Monash, which I think is in, presumably will be published soon, which showed at PAS, where they randomised babies to near puff versus just CPAP with um, bubble CPAP with prongs and showed a significant reduction in intubation rates in the delivery room without using the mask. And that's probably because the mask, one, creates an imposed work of breathing, and that's what was shown in this study where they showed a reduction in intubation. They also showed a reduction in death using this newer device, which I think is very unusual. I don't quite know how the device changes death, but I think the reduction in intubation is probably real um, and would fit with the, um, the, the study out of... Um, Monash, I've forgotten the name of it, um, which showed a reduction in intubation in the delivery room using CPAP with a short binasal prong and bubble system only rather than PPV and less need for So and then they use PPV with the mask as rescue. And I think the, the Monash group say that's because when you put the mask on, you actually make a baby stop breathing and close the vocal cords. But I also think it's more than that. It's probably the um, effect of the imposed work of breathing of having the mask and the big pressure on the system. So do think about the fact that the way we deliver CPAP may make it hard for a baby to breathe. And it can make it hard in two directions. So if you have a baby that has uh, too little um, CPAP pressure in the lungs, then you get an imposed work of breathing associated with overcoming the atelectasis. But likewise, if you have a lung that has too much pressure, you get an imposed work of breathing um, from the over distension and the effect that it has on your upper airway. Um, and these have been shown in a number of um, observational studies which have measured efficacy of ventilation and shown that there's a U-shaped relationship between work of breathing. And I think that's where sometimes the benefit of nasal IPPV comes in because we're then using we're trying to there provide some level of support that's cyclical rather than constant. Um, and in a baby who has a failing system, um, 
potentially going to nasal IPPV rather than just sequentially increasing your PEEP may provide an alternative to the work of breathing component problems of a higher PEEP. Um, but here you're trying to provide a cyclical period of higher pressure. Um, you could do that in different ways, and I don't think that matters as much. Um, generally, though, from a practical point of view, we, we set it to deliver a high and a low pressure cycle in some sort of rate that fits in with tidal ventilation, um, but it doesn't always have to be like that, and there's ways that you can do it outside of that. It can be triggered or non-triggered. Um, it can be used as a primary therapy or a step-down therapy or a rescue therapy when non-invasive ventilation is failing to prevent intubation. So we're adding in another group of treatments for it. And again, I think the way it works is not very simple. It's like CPAP. Um, it probably increases intrathoracic pressure. You would hope it would. Um, it probably facilitates tidal ventilation delivery. Again, you would hope it would, either directly by actually putting more gas in the lung or indirectly by making your imposed worker breathing less so you're more efficient when you take your spontaneous breath. Um, it probably um, stimulates breathing, at least I think most of us say clinically we see when we put it on baby to have less apneas. Um, it probably stabilises the upper airways and... Um, it may actually be delivering a tidal volume in situations of apnea if the baby's keeping the vocal cords open, which is a big if because we don't know much about them. But a lot of babies actually may well just, when they go apneic and hypertonic, actually keep their airway, their vocal cords open, which means you may be facilitating gas exchange there. Um, again, <clears throat> as a primary therapy for preterm RDS, we have a number of trials um, and we have a good meta-analysis. Um, most of those trials, I think, as many of you know, are influenced. Most of these meta analyses are influenced by just one or two big trials, in particular, Harash Kerpalani's large trial of non invasive ventilation. And they do show um, that compared to CPAP alone, there's a reduction in um, respiratory failure, um, which means a reduction in intubation, no real difference in mort mortality or serious morbidity, maybe a reduction in BPD. But I think the main impact is in reducing respir short term respiratory failure, so need for re intubation. And then um, it's whether, you, again, you think that a, a, a upper limit of 0.92 is enough to say you've reduced BPD. We see almost the same effect um, when we look at using NIPPV as an ex post extubation tool to prevent. Uh, to prevent complications of extubation, which we know is a real thing. Um, and again, we have a large number of trials, again, influenced by just a number of very large trials and then a lot of smaller ones. Um, so again, you see a significant benefit in reducing extubation failure. A number needed to treat of 11 is not fantastic, but for many of us, I think it's enough either to say that we will have... We are comfortable putting nasal IPPV on either as a first intention or when we see a baby struggling on, on normal CPAP. And I think that's probably where most of us use it. There um, did appear to be a reduction in air leak, which again, I think comes back to this concept from COIN that the COIN trial air leak may not have been related to PEEP. Because you imagine if you have a collapsed lung and you have to reopen it and then it collapses again with every breath because your CPAP level's too low, your sheer force injury could just as likely cause a pneumothorax as a lung which has been popped, which, are, you know, because it's too open. And in these trials, we're seeing a reduction in air leak when we're applying an intentionally higher mean airway pressure for at least part of the cycle. Um, again, no difference in short-term, um, uh, in longer-term morbidity and mortality. Um, they don't necessarily ask in the trial what PEEP to use, what PIP to use, what rate to use, what eye time to use, or when to deliver the PIP. And I'm not going to go through all of these because I think these are actually almost the same as on CPAP, right? The PEEP to use is the one that probably gives you the best gas exchange and work, minimises worker breathing and patient comfort. The PIP to use is probably the one that causes the best gas exchange and patient comfort. And, you know, I tend to find... I, we don't tend to use the sort of 10 to 12 PIPs. We actually use quite higher PIPs in some of our babies. The rate to use is probably depending on what your problem is. Are you using it for apnea support, airway support or gas exchange? And whether you're going to synchronise or not and how comfortable the baby is on it as well. Um, having unsynchronised NIPPV with a fast rate is probably just using a higher CPAP effectively, isn't it? And then what eye time to use, I think, also depends on the size of the baby and the lung disease you're using, but probably use a slightly longer eye time than I would on a conventional. Um, but there is a rationale for trying to synchronise. Um, 
because on conventional ventilation, as I showed yesterday for those who were there, um, in this study, which was a crossover study from a small and from a single site again, so it has that problems where they crossed babies over to SIMV without pressure support to pressure support at different levels, you got much more efficiency of ventilation and CO2 clearance when you had some degree of pressure support being applied to every inflation rather than some inflations. So I think there's a rationale there for synchronising in NIPPV because you're theoretically going to be unloading the respiratory system because we're not going to get big pressure and volume transmission during NIPPV like we do on conventional because we don't have an ET tube. But potentially by synchronising, we're making the efficiency of that baby's breathing more comfortable and maybe unloading some of this imposed work of breathing. I'll probably skip over this so we can get to the demonstrations but um, because I actually have some recordings on babies, but it was really around how we get the synchronisation right and we'll do this this afternoon in the workshop, so I might just skip over this now. Um, do we have any evidence that synchronisation on NIPPV works? Well, not really. Um, so, again, we don't have the large trials like we do for um, NIPPV generally and NIV generally. And the meta-analysis, again, um, only has a small number of trials for preventing extubation failure um, compared to unsynchronised NIPPV. But you can see there the number of babies in the meta-analysis that received synchronisation was only 272. The number of babies who received unsynchronised was over 1,000. Um, and you can see um, that the reduction in... Um, that whilst there was a reduction in extubation failure when they compared the two different modes in these this meta-analysis compared to CPAP alone, the number of 272 babies means that I think you have to be very cautious around any data that comes out of there when you've got a really well-weighted, unsynchronised population. Um, so maybe there's a prevention in intubation failure, extubation failure, but we don't really have uh, any trials. We have to remember that not all NIPPV synchronised modes are the same. Um, <clears throat> how does a ventilator know a baby's breathing when you've got an intubated patient generally they use a flow sensor to measure gas gas movement you can't do that when you've got an extubate or well, baby on non-invasive because you've got a huge leak and you lose a lot of um, stability so it's whilst people do do it it's not generally the way you should do it so most <laughs> synchronized systems either use a pressure trigger um, and you set the sensitivity of pressure change that's required. I always start the pressure trigger really high and then move it down if I'm going. Or they diaphragm, they trigger directly off the diaphragm. Um, and obviously if your diaphragm's moving, then you would assume you're breathing in. Um, and you can either trigger off a transcutaneous diaphragm EMG, um, which there is now a commercial version available, but it's not widely available and it's generally used as a research device. And you can obviously tr um, trigger off an electrical diaphragmatic activity measured from the esophagus using a esophageal catheter and that's NAVA. So we essentially have pressure triggers on most of them and NAVA available on one at the moment. We don't have a large trial that compares NAVA versus the others. So I think probably at the moment, any triggering device that works is an appropriate trigger. Um, there is a U US trial which has just started recruiting, which is comparing NAVA versus non-NAVA um, for, um, and that's called the DIVA trial, but that's going to be probably about four years, I would have thought, before it's finished recruiting. Um, and again, observationally, there's an advantage of, of diaphragmatic trigger, but I think probably we don't have the data yet. And if you're going to synchronise, just use what you've got and learn how to use it, um, because probably synchronisation alone is going to be better than unsynchronised. So I was just going to show, and I don't know how well these are going to show on the screen, um, four different patterns. So I'm trying to make this a bit clinically interactive. Um, so what you can see here is a ventilator at the bottom. And then something that we use quite a lot called electrical impedance tomography, which some of you may have heard about, where we put a little belt around the baby's chest and um, it measures, these are in, this is some lamb data, um, where we're measuring um, gas exchange inside the lung, tidal volume inside the lung, which is much better than measuring it here, because firstly you can see where it goes in the lung, left, right, left lung, right lung, so we can see, you can see pneumothoraces, if you intubate one bronchus, you can see it immediately. If you've got um, poor lung recruitment, you can see it. Um, but also, it's, it's only it's measuring what's happening in the lung. So if you've got a closed vocal cord 
or you've got pressure being delivered by a ventilator that's not being transmitted, we can see that opposed to measuring it off the ventilator where the ventilator's flow sensor will just say, well, you gave the volume, therefore it must have gone in. Um, and in this study, we've so we've got here um, animals that are on synchronised uh, IP, NIPPV um, and um, we also have an ultrasound on the vocal cords. So in this first one is what we want to see in, in our patients on... Um, synchronised modes, and you can see at the bottom in the ventilator on, on the SLE, the synchronisation is shown by the orange bar. Um, you want, sorry? Yeah, it is, yeah, it's the orange bar, yeah, the, in the pressure wave. And you generally see a little drop in pressure just beforehand as well when you see that. And what I want you to see, it's a bit fast on the, don't worry about this fancy bit up here, but if you look at the bottom, the blue wave is a tidal volume wave in the lungs. So you can see when it goes up, and then down, it looks like the tidal volume wave on a ventilator. That's when it goes up, that's tidal volume going into the lungs. When it goes down, that's expiration. And here is a really well synchronized uh, patient. And I've turned the sound off, but you can hear one of my colleagues doing the ultrasound who's actually saying, vocal cord open, vocal cord open, every time they see it open and close. And here, the vocal cord stayed open the high, entire time. And you'll see, so you'll see here, you can see every breath is synchronised or every pressure is synchronised and you'll be able to see that when the pressure wave occurs, it's very fast, the volume wave goes up. So synchronised wave, synchronised pressure, vocal cord open, gas exchange, tidal ventilation occurring, which is what we all expect to happen. What you'll see with the next one is you can see this, you'll see tidal ventilation happening um, but and the vocal cord is open but you'll see that we lose periods of synchronisation. So you'll get periods where, um, if you look on here, you'll see you've, you've, got, you've just lost synchronisation, but there was tidal volume still occurring. So that patient was still breathing, but the <coughs> ventilator wasn't able to generate a trigger there. So you've got less adequate triggering occurring. Now you've got really nice triggering, and you can see that you've got tidal volume occurring. But, now, but then at times we lose it, like we're just seeing now, and you've got maybe two or two every second breath getting a triggered inflation and every second breath isn't, even though the vocal cords are off opening. So the baby's breathing in a more, less synchronised pattern. What you're going to see in this next one is a um, an initial picture where you have pressure change occurring in the pharynx and you're getting synchronisation, but the vocal cords are shut. So you'll see there's no ventilation occurring, but the ventilator at times thinks that the patient's breathing. And then, and then the uh, lamb starts breathing normally and it synchronises. So you'll see here, you can see this pressure change occurring in the bottom, but for those first few breaths there, there was no volume change. And now you can see you've got volume change occurring. Um, so that's just telling us just to remember that on synchronised NIPPV, if there's pressure or, or diaphragm movement occurring, depending on how you do it, but the vocal cords are shut, the ventilator says it's doing it all, but there's actually no volume change occurring. And then this last one's really quite interesting. So watch here, the volume change. Look here, you've got these really long plateaus that are occurring in inspiration, and then this very short drop. And interestingly, when we looked, the vocal cords are open and the ventilator was synchronising well in NIPPV. When we looked at the vocal cords, they were kind of just going, they would open it like this. So they were just snapping open for a second and like microsecond and then shutting. And what you can see in the volume there is this very rapid drop in volume, then it goes up and then it holds. That's the glottic closure or inspiratory hold that you hear people talk about. So the baby's got bad RDS and the lung is collapsing so quickly the ba and the baby's actually thinking about this and going, every breath I breathe out, I'm causing so much atelectasis, I'm losing my FRC. So the baby's really clever, and this is a lamb, so clearly babies are more clever than lambs. Um, it, it's basically going, every time I open my vocal cords, I'm losing all my gas. This is awful. Like, you know, my elastic recoil is so high because of my RDS. So the best thing for me to do is not to open my vocal cords and to keep the pressure up in my lungs. That's auto-peep. So this is a baby just opening the vocal cords just long enough to let a little bit of gas wash in and out and then keeping them closed to maintain auto-peep. And the ventilator obviously won't be able to manage that. The only way you're going to be able to fix that is to increase your PEEP and hope that that transmits across the lung. But that's what you see in acute RDS. And probably that's what we're seeing in the delivery room too when we see a baby grunting in the delivery room. And I think, you know, this is... I, I kind of like that picture because I think it's really quite cool that firstly...
babies are clever enough to know to do this. So they know that we've got the treatment wrong and their lung disease is right, but they're trying to keep their peep up themselves and maintain their lung disease. And secondly, we can now see it with lung ultrasound and um, EIT. So that's just to show that it's not as simple as unconventional. Because unconventional, you either synchronise, you don't synchronise, gas goes in or it doesn't go. So I've, these are hot off the press, so I don't know if they're useful. What about nasal high frequency, which I get asked about a lot because it's available now and we see it. Um, what nasal high frequency is, is not high frequency. And in fact, when we did this review paper, one of the reviewers said, I want you to write about nasal high frequency in the review paper. And we wrote back and said, no, because high frequency and nasal high frequency are not the same thing. They're totally different modalities. Um, high frequency, nasal high frequency is CPAP with a high frequency wave. So it's essentially a variant of an NIPPV. Um, where you're hoping that the oscillatory wave is providing some modulation of gas exchange across a multi-frequency thing, but it might also just simply be acting on the upper airways, like NIPPV, because you're offering a high pre you're, off you're basically giving a pressure change in the upper airways. Um, practically, we don't have any RCTs of outcome. We have a number of single site reports, particularly from uh, Toronto, so anyone who's worked in Toronto, I think they use it quite a lot at Mount Sinai. And in France, they use it at a number of centres quite um, aggressively. Um, those sites show that it's very effective in reducing extubation failure in their populations. But I would just caution about saying that we know that's the true for all babies, because again, like many things, they've got good at using it, um, and therefore they may just be good at using it. And if you're better at using something else, you may be just as good. And then there's a couple of things just to think about when you read those papers. Some of those earlier papers, and I think Mount Sinai does this, they set their mean airway pressure much higher than on CPAP. So they start a couple of centimetres of water above, right? So, sorry? Yeah, so my question is, back to them, is if you're starting two to four centimetres higher, how do we know it's the high frequency wave and not just the higher peak that was the thing that was useful there, right? So, and I, I've yet to see a lot of data that shows that high frequency, nasal high frequency at the same peak as on CPAP is different. And I think that's what we need to be sure that it's the high frequency wave that matters and not just that we've done an inadvertently higher uh, peak setting. Um, <clears throat> most of the papers have generally reported frequencies of 10 as the default, and I think that's probably not unreasonable. There's different guidelines on how to set delta P, but I think most people set the delta P just to wiggle the chest. I've seen in some babies when I've used it that there can be quite a lot of, some babies don't tolerate it, they bob their, they get a lot of head bob and become quite uncomfortable on it and you have to turn it on, and some babies find it very comfortable. So I would only use it in a baby if I started it, if they've got appropriate um, comfort levels and they're not fighting. There is high energy transmission, which we need to be aware of. Um, and But it does actually alter what's happening in the lungs. So this is some work from, um, came out of a Swiss Melbourne study. And you can see here we used EIT again to measure babies who are on nasal high frequency using a, a standardized approach. And one of the advantages of nasal high, of EIT is you can break the signal down into different components. So we were able to separate the signal being caused by tidal ventilation versus the oscillatory wave. And you can see that there was quite a different signal. That's right. And when we, um, when we looked at where the gas volume was, the high frequency wave was actually causing a different distribution of gas in the lungs than just the tidal one. So it definitely does change what's happening in the lungs. Um, <clears throat> when we then looked at... Um, our data and some of the other data, we could see that there was a, a reduction in desaturation episodes, which have been reported generally in all of the case uh, case series of this, um, compared to um, non uh, CPAP alone. Um, and in some of the sites, a reduction in extubation failure. Interestingly, in our study, when we reported it, we found that with nasal high frequency, we had less desaturations, but we had a higher required FO2, which I suspect may be some of the work of breathing component. There's only one RCT that I'm aware of, um, which is again a large uh, RCT that came out of China with 
more than 1,400 babies uh, who are preterm and moderately preterm. Um, and it was a three-pathway trial of nasal CPAP versus NIPPV versus nasal uh, high-frequency. And they showed that compared to the other two, nasal high-frequency reduced duration of ventilation, um, there was no difference in extubation failure or ventilation efficiency across the, the different arms, but there was a reduction in need for, for intubation. Um, but again, this study comes back to this issue of treatment equivalency because the nasal high frequency group had a higher mean airway pressure than the CPAP or non-invasive group. So again, is it the treatment or is it just the pressure? Um, and, and this just summarises this in some ways and just showing that the um, nasal CPAP group started at five and would allow up to eight, but the nasal high frequency group started at 10 and then you could go up to 16 or wean down to five. So a very different approach. Um, and the NIPBV group, again, started at quite low settings and then allowed an escalation approach. So I, I don't quite know whether there's a difference, how to interpret these differences, and I think practice will, will, will dictate that with time. And again, none of these... I think the other thing we need to think about is no-one's yet compared nasal high frequency to bubble CPAP. And if you talk to Jane Pillow about this, she... And if any of you have heard Jane talk, I don't know. She's very firm on her views. Um, she would argue that nasal high frequency offers much less spectrum of frequency waves than bubble CPAP, which is the way more chaotic wave. And she feels that bubble CPAP will be, if not equivalent, probably a more effective way of delivering a multi-frequency system into the circuit. So I think um, it comes down to your resources. If you're looking at nasal high frequency and you don't have bubble CPAP, then maybe, but I, I think um, it's a nursing level of training that I think probably stands it back a little bit at this moment. Just to go over birth, which is the last area of NIV, and again, some of you know this is where we foc our research focuses on a lot. Birth is different because <clears throat> when you've got acute respiratory failure, then obviously your problem <laughs> is maintaining tidal ventilation against the challenges of your lung disease, whether that's atelectasis or overdistension. When you're extubating, it's maintaining the same tidal ventilation against your lung disease. Um, but at birth, when you're born, you have to also add in the first step, which is actually to clear the airways and the lung, the lung tissue of fluid. Because, and that's your priority. Tidal ventilation is not your priority at birth. Your priority is to clear lung liquid and establish FRC. And then you need to defend that FRC because you will still have that lung liquid in your lungs for a while. And we've shown in some work we've done, again, in the delivery with EIT in human babies, that healthy term babies still clearly have lung liquid in their lungs um, because you can see the fluid interface when we image them with EIT. And that a healthy term baby who adequately transitions to birth using predominantly crying is doing things in their lung to move lung volume to areas that are full of lung liquid and to protect that lung liquid uh, clearance by creating this auto peak that I showed before with the vocal cords. So um, what they're doing is they're breaking expiration to maintain an intrinsic peep in their lungs and therefore they're allowing gas volume to move into the areas which are still fluid filled or to stop the areas which are still surrounded by fluid refilling, they're filling their alveolar up. And that takes a number of inflations to clear through. So until you do that, you don't really want to worry too much about tidal ventilation because tidal ventilation will be inefficient. <clears throat> and at least in animal studies, the PEEP and PIP you need to undergo the birth transition is always higher than the PEEP and PIP you need to undergo normal tidal ventilation. And if we think again about the term baby, you can imagine that's the case. When you take a cry, we know from some of those studies that were done by the Milner Group in the UK in the 70s, um, that when they measured intrapharyngeal pressure, some babies generate pressures of 100 centimetres of water when they cry. So they're generating really high pressures as part of that process of the birth transition. I wouldn't do that in a preterm baby, but clearly a preterm baby lacks the mechanisms to generate these high flow, high pressure, um, auto peak type situations. And that's why most preterm babies need some degree of pressure support in the, in the delivery room. But we don't know which pressure to use. We know that some babies, a low pressure will be harmful and some babies a high pressure will be harmful. Clearly there's a sweet spot in between, but we don't know if it's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10 or 11. 
we've gone from this, the high frequency stuff I talked about earlier and said, well, in high frequency, if we use an open lung, we're titrating the peep and allowing time so we don't just chuck in there and get going and say we know what's right. And if we take the SAIL trial, which I don't know if have you all heard about the SAIL trial. Yeah. And what did that show? Sorry? Yeah, so it showed no difference in DEF or BPD overall. Um, a sick, but they stopped the trial at 440 out of 660 recruits because there was an early death signal, which was high in percentage but small in numbers, right? So it was nine versus, it was only a small number of deaths, but the percentage wise was higher, and that was deemed to be statistically important, and the trial stopped. Um, and the mechanism of death was unknown which is a real problem with that trial. But the concern was because it was early that there's a rationale that it's related to the intervention. And the meta-analysis that was occurring at that time on some of the other trials did suggest there was potentially a safety signal on IVH as well, but that wasn't seen in the SAIL trial. So I'm not opposed to a sustained inflation, what, but I am opposed to a sustained inflation. Physiologically, I don't have a huge issue with a sustained inflation. Clinically, I have an issue with a sustained inflation because it's assuming that at birth you know exactly what pressure the baby needs. And clearly, if there is a harm signal, it's because we've given too little, too much, or too long a pressure, right? That's the only thing that was different in the sustained inflation. And if we don't know, then I'm cautious about starting at giving a high peak to a baby where I don't know if that's the right one or the wrong one. So I think the open lung approach where we titrate up or down, I think has a rationale in the delivery room where we're starting life not knowing and we have a trial that says there might be a harm signal if we don't know. So that's my reason I don't like a sustained inflation. It assumes I'm right and always when I know that I'm right, rarely. So, and the baby's always right. So we have been interested in looking at whether you could increase peak slowly in the delivery room and then potentially decrease it when you move to that phase of, of tidal ventilation. Um, and, and that sort of dynamic, we call it a dynamic peep because an open lung peep sounds confusing in the delivery room and people get confused. Um, and we've done a lot of LAM evidence supporting this, showing that it reduces lung injury compared to a sustained inflation or an NRP approach at a peep of eight in eight, these studies. But in our LAMs, we go up to peeps of 20. Um, as a dynamic approach, really to push them hard to see what happens. And there's no difference. There's um, an improvement in lung injury markers and there's an improvement in eration and homogeneity of eration. We have a number of clinical experiences with this. These are observational studies. So um, the first one that was published is out of um, Ian Tapas and Angela Cribbs two units. So they looked at different practices so in Ian's unit, they use the near puff and follow NRP. So the babies are ventilated, at, are supported at birth with peeps of five to six, uh, sort of five to eight. And um, in Angela Cripps' unit in Germany, they use the Bella Vista, which is a German device, where if you're not in, you don't change peep, you change flow. And inadvertently, you change peep doing that. And you can increase every step in flow you take makes a big change in peep. And when they've tested that by device, at the maximum flow setting on the device, you deliver a peep of 35. So by default, you're giving a very high peep when you turn use that device. And they compared the two sites' practice um, and showed that there was a reduction in the need for intubation using the Bella Vista device, a lower FIO2 in the Bella Vista group in Germany, but a much higher rate of air leak. And particularly in the babies that were receiving peeps greater than 15 with the Bella Vista. So that would suggest that using a high peep is useful but could come with too much of a risk. In this single site in Paris, they changed practice from using a PEEP of five in the delivery room to using a sustained inflation followed by dynamic PEEP strategy. So if the baby's not responding to clinical care, they give a sustained inflation of up to 20, 15 to 20 seconds and they increase the PEEP by two to three. And they keep increasing the PEEP and giving a sustained inflation up to a PEEP of 15. Um, and then if the baby's in less than 40% oxygen, they start dropping the PEEP down sequentially. And... Um, <clears throat> They've shown that there was a reduction in intubation in the delivery room. Um, they showed a big reduction in BPD, which I think is unlikely because it's a single site trial. It seems very strange to get a 20% reduction in BPD like that. Um, and they showed no difference in air leak, but they only went up to a peep of 15 compared to peeps over 15. And interestingly, and I showed this yesterday, I think the best bit about this study is that only 30% of their babies could be supported with a PEEP of five in the delivery room. So 70% needed some escalation 
and 50% of those babies needed an escalation up to 10 centimetres of water or more. It at least shows it's feasible, but it tells us nothing about safety or efficacy. So we're now recruiting into this study, which we're leading, um, and it's occurring in about 25 sites across um, the world at the moment, where we're aiming to compare a high dynamic PEEP compared to a static standard PEEP during stabilisation, which we define as the first up to the first 20 minutes after birth in babies under 29 weeks and over tw 23 weeks and over, and the outcome is survival without BPD. So it's a big picture outcome. To achieve that with sufficient power, we're having to recruit 906 babies, which is a lot of babies. Um, and um, we're comparing starting at a PEEP of eight and then an algorithm that allows the clinicians to increase the PEEP up to a maximum of 12 before intubation. But also if they increase the PEEP, they can then decrease the PEEP if the baby clinically improves, which we define as an FIO2 less than 30%. Um, compared to starting at the lower end of NRP, which is a PEEP of five to six and not changing the PEEP throughout resuscitation. Um, and um, we are recruiting. More importantly, I think, is the secondary outcomes, which are around sort of short-term measures of respiratory support in the in, in the NICU, which I think are still important. So we have two different algorithms, and each site develops their own algorithm with us, and then we work with each site's um, resus team to develop a way of training that fits in with their training module um, for NRP. And essentially, it's a very similar NRP algorithm, and all of these are available online at the website, which is at the bottom there, and you can see different examples. There's some videos and all sorts of things, the whole multimedia thing, we've even got a YouTube thing and all sorts of stuff. Um, the dynamic PEEP is a complicated one, but to simplify it for the fellows, the way we teach it is that if you're a susceptible baby and the baby's not getting better and you're going to do NRP things like Mr. Soper, you also increase the PEEP at the same time. And if they don't get better after that, you increase the PEEP again. And when they're at a PEEP of 12, you don't go any higher. If they meet the intubation criteria for NRP, then you intubate them, obviously. If they get better at a higher PEEP, you stay there until their FO2 is less than 30%. So if they've got better, but they haven't got remarkably better, don't decrease the PEEP, just continue resuscitating them at that PEEP. If their FO2 goes below 30%, you stepwise it down and you keep doing that throughout the, the intervention. And um, so again, just to summarise, I've sort of covered a lot of things and we'll do a demonstration next. So have a break from lectures and a Q and A. Um, but I think, you know, there's a lot of different CPAP systems. You there's not going to be one that works for all babies or all NICUs because at the end of the day, CPAP is a nursing therapy. So I think if I tell them, like the nurses often on the ward around to me say, what CPAP system do you want to put on the baby? I say, whatever one you want because you know how to do it better than me um, because it's rare that a doctor needs to say what CPAP system's needed. The nurses are the one that the experts, we just kind of pretend we know. Um, I think CPAP levels matter but we don't yet really have a good set of ways of actually nuancing them to a level where we can be sure which one to use. But there's never going to be one right CPAP. So if you work in a unit that says every baby has to be on six or eight, I would ask you should think about changing that. But at the moment, you've got to change it with caution, not change it with another protocol. And we still need large trials on non-invasive ventilation, on extubation, acute lung disease, delivery room, and in BP, chronic BPD, which is another group I haven't talked about where I think many of us are moving to using much higher CPAP in babies with established chronic lung disease. So again, thanks for the second talk and I'd be interested to see your comment, your questions or, or problems. And if you wanna go look at the trial, the website's there. Um, we were talking about it yesterday, we'll probably aren't going to be able to run it in India at the moment because uh, um, we're sort of a third of the way. We've got 300 babies in now um, and it's probably going to be, by the time we open up a whole new country, it'll probably be too hard. And I actually think that um, I wonder if these sort of delivery room trials, it actually would be better if India ran their own trial because you could probably recruit about three times as many babies and um, and it's probably more generalizable if if it was run out of India rather than someone from somewhere else telling you how to run a trial in India. And ultimately, that's what I think we need to move for. We need to actually work towards large clinical trials which look at different regions recruiting into parallel arms so that generalizability is more appropriate. But I don't know, that's another discussion. I don't know what you all think about that.
CPAP's easy. Do you all extra, do, is there a variability in CPAP levels or do you, what CPAP would you use to extubate a preterm baby? Five to six? Six? Why? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. The UK uses a lot lower CPAP than Europe, doesn't it? I don't know if any of you have looked at European, continental European centres. They use much higher CPAPs than the UK. Yeah. So if you had a two-month-old, X 25 weeker who had chronic lung disease, who's just been re-intubated for a stoma closure, what would you extubate that baby to? Like seven, seven, See? Six, seven, eight. In, there's places that would extubate those babies to eight to 12. Yeah. yeah. So, but the key thing is you understanding the need to extubate to a higher peak because it's not acute RDS, right? And a small baby. Yeah. Again. Is that like uh, suggesting what some sort of an open lung ventilation? <coughs> yeah. So that was <coughs> that was Reisha's PhD, and she wasn't doing it as a clinical trial. She was doing it to try to see what happened to the lungs when you did it. So if this has not been tested clinically, um, and I think this this reflects. So this was a physiological study. Um, it showed it was feasible. She waited 20 minutes per step, so it was a very long process because she wanted to be really sure she had new stable volumes. It shows it's feasible but wasn't a clinical trial, so we have no outcome around clinical interventions. And it was really interesting. Most of these babies actually had FO2s of less than 30%, and changing the CPAP level didn't actually change the FO2 much, but there was a statistical change in lung volume. It was a noticeable difference, which I think is telling you that for many of our babies, it probably actually doesn't matter that much. Because if their RDS isn't that bad, they're not going to really... They'll, they'll do well whatever we do. And probably the best thing we do is to stay away from them as much as possible, right? Um, and this comes down to sort of the concept of phenotyping the preterm infant. The baby who's in 24% on CPAP at 12 hours is very different from the baby who's in 40% on CPAP at 12 hours. So they're a different phenotype and we need a different treatment for that. Um, but no, we don't have a open lung strategy in high, on CPAP yet, um, apart from what we're doing in the polar trial, which is clearly an open lung strategy, but a very slow one because you could well do your... It's patient-initiated change rather than physiologically-initiated change. So you could change your CPAP level between one and two minutes from eight to ten and not change it again for five, six, ten minutes and then increase it or decrease it. So it's more of a titratable one, which I think is going to be an easier way to translate it into clinical practice if it shows a benefit. Um, the, the LCAT trial that just finished, that's about to be published, I don't know why they didn't do a dynamic PEEP, but I think they took a much more simplistic response, which is babies fail CPAP extubation, they fail extubation because their lung FRC drops, therefore we need to support their FRC with more... Um, more pressure and they took it from this study of Reishas and said, well, look, all of the babies had more FRC when they had a higher PEEP, so therefore we'll use that higher PEEP. But um, what I think they failed there is that from Reishas' study, which is still only small, it's 20 babies, 50% of the babies could be on a much lower PEEP within 20 minutes of being on... They were, once they got to 10, 20 minutes later, they were dropped to a PEEP of 8 and they had the same lung volume. So why not drop them down? So And 50% didn't. And this is where we don't have the tools yet. And that's why I just sort of say when we're looking at CPAP levels, don't be afraid to practice changing them. Um, and then wait and see what happens. You can always go back. Um, and probably NIPPV is a de facto way of doing a dynamic PEEP if you think about it. You comment on uh, CPAP being and it's based on the medical trial that you do cycling, correct? It's some <coughs> practice cycling. So you 
coming cycling or See, I, again, I was always of the view that cycling was crazy. But, um, but if I reflect back on it and be honest, that's probably because the person who taught me told me it was crazy rather than anything else. And I think, you know, you can argue it both ways, right? I think I, I worry a bit about cycling as a default because you're really taking a baby and imposing stress on their system, right? But the rationale is that you train them to be able to breathe faster and maybe you help their diaphragm. Uh, I just wonder if it's – my preference is just to slowly wean their peep or wean their peep levels down and train them that way. Um, I wouldn't use cycling as a first way to wean a baby from acute lung disease, but I definitely have come around to using cycling for babies who have had long periods of respiratory support or may have airway problems as, a, as opposed to lung problems or they have a structural lung uh, chest wall problem. So I have – gone from being thinking cycling was just a way of making the doctor feel like they were doing something and yeah um to thinking that it probably still is just that um but there's probably a group of babies who do benefit from brief periods off the other group sometimes is the neurological babies that are on non-invasive so upper airway neurological sometimes i believe it, it might be worthwhile but generally we just drop the cpap down to and if they're a preterm baby once they're at a cpap of four if I want five or less, I would just extubate them. And if they're a term baby, generally six or less. Sometimes we'll drop them down to peeps of three if we're really worried, but it's probably default cycling as well. I don't know. Do most people here cycle? Again, I think the other thing that stops cycling a lot is that a lot of us now will, um, if we're worried, we'll put the baby on high flow, right? Yeah. So they'll be in five, six centimetres of water peep and we'll pick them onto high flow which is just another way of weaning, essentially. But probably most of us use high flow mainly as a weaning tool, um, not as an acute therapy tool. And I think, you know, I haven't talked about high flow, but the meta-analysis shows that high flow is, is probably inferior in acute lung disease, in prematurity, and probably similar in ex and, and acute extubation. But for weaning, it's probably good. And definitely <clears throat> the nursing level of care on high flow makes it much more... Um, uh, um, um, appropriate for our nurseries because we've always got too much pressure on our system, right? So if we can put, we, I don't know, our babies go into high flow and then they can be on low level nursing care for the rest of their stage rather than needing experienced nurses looking after them. The difficulty I think with high flow is it's, it's, it's like a, it's become a drug of addiction for clinicians. It's almost, I don't know what it's like in India, but it's so hard to get a baby off high flow. Is it the same here? We've definitely seen extended periods, like admissions are longer since high flows come in. But do you find that your nurses are happy to take them off? Like we find, you, you know, you've got these babies on it and you take them off. Yeah. But are they because they're, yeah, but then, but the clinician only decides until the sun sets and you go home. Yeah, but the number of babies we have that are on high flow and you take them off high flow and then overnight they're put back on because the baby's had a couple of DSATs. As they say, I'm putting back on high flow and then the DSATs go away, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then it's... Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the hard bit about high flow is coming off high flow is really can be quite hard in some babies. I think before lunch we're going to look at some open lung. I think with the group size, we're going to try to show it on the screen. So I think these guys are going to flick it over. We've got a pig lung, which um, has been treated with a preservative. It's used for high school teaching. And that preservative effectively has created an RDS model. So just be aware that this is an adult pig lung. So it's really big. So we'll show it on the video. We might put it we're going to show on this. We want to show this up as close as we can. I don't know how close up you can go. Can you zoom in more? And if you can't see it on the camera, you can come and have a look later. Do it after lunch, not before lunch. Um, and what you'll see when it's right now, it's exposed to atmosphere. So this is basically totally collapsed lung, uh, and an FRC, it has got a bit of volume in it. 
And you'll see it looks quite injurious um, and injured. Um, and we've got very atelectatic lung um, where you've got no, virtually little no, no gas exchanging. We're going to use an uncuffed a cuffed tube. I'll explain. Um, <clears throat> now put it so, should do want to do a calibration? Can you hear me on this? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm just going to put him on conventional in a minute. And So we'll be very neonatal. We'll go 20 on 5, a rate of 50. There's obviously no point synchronising this one. Um, and um, I'll set the eye time 0.35. And now I will actually just, we might film this. Um, and what you can see, hopefully, see how that lung is only ventilating in a couple of places. So this is what you see with HMD, is that what you, the lung disease is the same in the whole lung. The lung is surfactant deficient. But the lung mechanics are different in different parts of the lung, dependent on the airways, the gravity, um, and various other, fa and with uh, various other factors. So the areas that are least diseased and most will ventilate early. But you can see here that even if we were at five or six or seven mil per kilo, we think we're being lung protective, but you would hardly say that that is going to be not injurious to the lung. Right? And again, it's not unsurprising here because on conventional ventilation, we have an equipment, this is a adult size lung, and we're ventilating it with neonatal settings. So we expect that it's not going to be that fantastic. So, But if we increase our PIP, before I go and do open lung, I just want to demonstrate that PIP and PEEP do different things. It's PIP that recruits the lung, it's PEEP that maintains it. So we'll keep our PEEP quite low, five, and we'll go up quite a bit in our pressure. The good thing is no one's, no parents are going to tell me off. So I've just doubled my PIP. And you can see now I've got one more tidal ventilation, but also more areas engaging in tidal ventilation. So you can see the recruitment occurring. But do you see what's happening between each breath? We're losing it all, right? So we've got good gas exchange. We'll get gas exchange to a degree, but we're not actually helping being lung protective. And I'll keep going up in my peep, pip. So now I'm up to a pip of uh, 50, which probably you don't use that often. Um, and again, you can see we're getting tidal ventilation, right? And we're getting more of the lungs ventilating, but we're losing it between each breath. We're on a very low peak for this. We'll go all the way up. As I said, no one's going to tell me off. Now we're up 60. Again, more recruit, more ventilation, but we're losing it between those breaths. So now let's add in some peak. And I'm going to turn the rate right down. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm going to turn the rate down so it's a bit easier to see and also a bit safer. So we're going to a much lower rate, so you can really see that what's happening in PEEP. And it also is getting rid of the auto PEEP, which we'll talk about after lunch. Um, so you can now see that, that the recruitment's current. Now let's put some PEEP in. So I've just doubled the PEEP to 10. And you can see it's probably not making a huge difference, is it? Maybe a little bit, but not really a big difference. Let's just go all the way up to a PEEP of 20. Is that making a difference? What's happening? It's, yeah, it's staying open in expiration, right? But also, more of the lung is actually aerating slowly. So you see, with each breath, we're getting some, we're getting more volume in the lung as well. So this is what I was saying yesterday. It's PIP that recruits the lung, but without PIP, you lose that recruitment. So PIP recruits the lung. Uh, so PIP recruits the lung and PEEP maintains recruitment. So, and I've almost done like a stepwise PEEP recruitment here, right? Um, we can go 
really high. This ventilator is quite good because it goes up to very high peaks. Um, and you can now see that we have a really well aerated lung, right? And the other thing we can see is that most of the lung is now ventilated and aerated. So before we had just the bit here and a little bit here that was moving. Now you can see that a lot of the lung is open and it's moving, but it's moving a little bit. Maybe my peak's too high now, right? So I am on a peep of 30, so I don't know. I've never used a peep of 30 in a baby, but maybe it's probably too high in a baby, most of us would say. Right? So we'll go back down again and see if our ventilation improves. And you can see we, we still have that uniform aeration. Um, and you can see now that the amount of lung motion in each inflation is probably is a lot better, right? So I was probably getting a bit of over distension with a higher peak and now I've probably got a more appropriate one. So that's what happens on conventional, yeah? So, and now I'll go right back down. Here we are getting that collapse. It occurs over a few breaths, but did you see that for the first few inflations, it actually was still maintaining fairly uniform recruitment. That's the hysteresis. The lung has this thing called volume history where it remembers the way it behaved before. So whatever happened to it before, it'll behave similarly the next time. And then it so it changes over time. So now we're starting to get atal emphasis again, and we'll make this lung really atelectatic. So now we're back where we started. And you can see I'm on that sort of 25, I'm back to 25 on four, but I'm from Australia, so I'll put it at six because we don't use four. Um, and I've got that low rate again. Um, and you can see that quite nicely that I've got those minimal areas irate, ventilating and a lot of areas are not irate. So if this was a human, we'd probably be saying they're really sick right now um, and therefore we should try them on an oscillator because they're failing conventional, right? Um, so let's just think about how we do this in clinical practice. So we've currently got, I'll put it all up a little bit so I'm not <coughs> faking it. Because most babies who fail conventional ventilation and go to oscillation are failing at generally about a map of 12 on conventional. We generally say at a map of 12, you're needing pips over 25, so therefore we should oscillate to be lung protective. So let's take, I'm now on a map of 10. Let's put this, do, let's put this lung onto a high frequency of a map of 14, right? Which is two above 12 in clinical practice or four above what I'm currently I'm going to use a reasonably low frequency here because this is an adult lung and it's pretty big. So um, using a frequency of 12, 13, 14, 15 is not appropriate here. Theoretically, actually, I probably should put this lung on about eight, five, somewhere between 5 and 8. But I'll, I'll start it at 10 just because it's a nice number and we'll play around with that later. So I've just gone to a map of uh, 14, a frequency of 10, an IE ratio of 1 to 2, and I've left the delta P at 4 centimetres of water. So you can clearly see there's no wiggle there. And let's put that up just a little bit. And it's not really wiggling much, uh, just a little bit, but that because most of the lung will still not be ventilating, right? You can see it's quite atelectatic. This lung actually needs quite a bigger wiggle. So now I'm up to 45 delta P. And you might not be able to see it, but I am seeing wiggle. Oh yeah, there's some wiggle occurring there. But you can see I've gone to two above conventional, and I'm actually not really doing much, am I? That lung's still atelectatic. And you would expect there would be no improvement in oxygenation, or if not, maybe a little bit worse if you've changed circuits. So let's kind of do an open lung. For this lung, I'm not going to go by two centimetres of water because lunch will be waiting for us. I'll go four centimetres of water because I also know in these big lungs you generally need much higher pressures. Um, so let's just go up by four and see what happens. I haven't played this one, so this may or may not work, but I think I 
think you, you, you cheated yesterday. You checked it out yesterday. So is there any lung recruitment? Yes. Where, where was it? I missed it. Left side, OK. The way the lung recruits is not uniform. It recruits in little areas at a time. And if this one's really quite good to come and watch later when you get up close, you might see areas that are really red and collapsed, like here. Um, and if you watch these areas, you'll suddenly see they pop open and have little white bits that look a little bit like a little bullet, but that's actually newly aerated lung tissue. So there's been some change, maybe. You guys seem more convinced than me. Um, let's go up again and see what happens. Yep, and there you could see, yeah. there was, and it was quite quick, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, and that's definitely what you would see here because you've got a lung that's not contained in the chest wall. It'll take a bit longer when you've got a lung surrounded by chest wall. But it's still quite quick and most of the change occurs quite quickly because it's an exponential change that occurs. But we've seen that we've now got some recruitment. Um, you seem like you've got a bigger lung volume, maybe a bit more uniform. The little area I was pointing to, some has opened up, but there's still some dark spots just in here, which hopefully will open up soon. So let's go... Clinically, we'd expect oxygenation to improve now, right? Yes. Hopefully, blood pressure is not worse as well, um, and all of those other factors, but you'd expect oxygenation to improve. So you would say to yourself, well, I went up in mean airway pressure, oxygenation improved. So the baby has told me that I have now recruited more lung units to gas exchange. That's all it can be, assuming the cardiovascular system hasn't changed. And you have changed. So, more I've increased lung volume because I increased pressure. Oxygenation got better, so therefore I must have new lung volume engaged in gas exchange. So that worked. So maybe if I do it again and see what happens, because I've got a lung which is now defined as recruitable. It's not yet recruited, but it's recruitable and it's engaging in recruitment. So now I've got up to twenty-eight. And you can start to see that, well, I can see it, that those areas here I was pointing to, they've now opened right up. There's none of the little little pockets. So you'll be able to see it if you come here um, that we had before. And the lung is now looking uniform. Yes. So when we talk about uniform lung recruitment, this is what we're talking about. So I would expect the FO2 to have got better, my oxygenation got better again. And I can say, well, I've, if that has happened, I've still got a lung which is recruitable. So let's see if I can recruit it some more. And I've seen, now you've seen that the overall lungs increase, but it's increased very uniformly. Eventually I'm gonna start over distending this lung, right? Um, and the downside of the open lung, the thing that people find hard with it, is to truly know what your boundaries are. What is the pressure that recruits the lung and what is the pressure that de-recruits the lung? To truly know them, you actually have to go beyond them. So to know when the lung de-recruits, you have to de-recruit it. To know the lung's over distended, you have to over distend it. So for a lot of clinicians, they find that a bit uncomfortable. But they say, I'm clinically doing something I know I shouldn't be doing. Now, what we need to ask ourselves is, is it okay if we're in experienced hands, and we know we're doing this, it's a controlled thing, then do we know, are we comfortable that doing this for a couple of minutes is safe compared to potentially having a atelectatic lung for a couple of hours or days? So that's um, why most of us think that it's okay to do it. But obviously now if you're getting worried, you'd probably stop, even if you're seeing improvement. And if definitely if you're not used to doing this, I generally say don't go above means of 24, 25 on a baby. When you're really experienced, if you like in the Netherlands and in, in our unit, many of us will go up to 30 because we know which baby needs that. I wouldn't do it if you're not used to it because going up to mean airway pressure of 30 is a fairly, um, fairly audacious thing to do. <laughs> but eventually, if we keep going up, we'll get to a point where we see no further benefit. And I've just gone to 36. And probably there wasn't a big change there. I don't know. What did you think? Really? Yeah. So now, clearly we've got a recruited lung. We'd hope gas exchange is better. But we're also using numbers which are very uncomfortable. 
Like this is 36, which is really high. Now, obviously it's a big lung and it's very sick. Um, if we trust the lung to have hysteresis, we should be able to now de-recruit the lung because of volume history, it's now not atelectatic, it's now not recruiting, it's now recruited. And when a lung is recruited, it stays recruited and to a very low mean airway pressure. So this is the hysteresis or the deflation limb. So if we come down by four, we should start to see some, um, you start to see the lung drop in size, but you shouldn't see the lung lose its homogeneity or uniformity, which is what we're seeing now. It's staying all the same. And we can keep doing that. And one would assume that the oxygenation is staying the same now because you've got more gas, more lung units involved in gas exchange. And I just want you in your head to try to remember what the lung looked like at 14 when we started. You can see we're still keeping all that recruitment. We're down now to 24. Those areas that we're focusing on here are still open. And I can feel it, but the lung feels like a full sponge, not a collapsed sponge. Now I'm down to 20. And you can still see at 20 I've got that recruitment there. I think overall the volume has dropped a wee bit. Um, but it's still that uniformity that's there. And we're going to start now going to the magic zone. We're going to 16. And I'm sure you're dying in anticipation to see what it looks like at 14 because I asked you to remember that. So let's go there. I only go down by two, but let's go there. So does that look different than it looked before? Does anyone disagree? No? Have I convinced you all? Yeah? Or did you already know it and you didn't need convincing? So you can see that lung is different at 14. It's the same mean airway pressure. That's because we've changed its state. We've changed it from atelectasis and recruitable to recruited. So it's a different lung. Now we're at 10, and I think I saw that the lung volume started to drop quite a bit there. Yes. Right. But it's, and it's now starting, those areas are starting to go dark colour here. Yeah. So I would expect now that this lung would start to show hypoxia. <coughs> um, I'll just go to 8. I won't go to 6, but we'll go to 8. And I think now you're starting to see these areas here are starting to really drop. What happens clinically, when you get to that number, probably here it would have been a 10, not 8, the saturations drop really quickly. Like, as you're watching, you see them plummet. So you need to be ready for that, because that's not the time to go get a coffee or try to explain lung physiology, right? Um, so, because now we've got a lung which we've was recruited, and now it's atelectatic again. And here's where people often make a mistake, and they say, well, actually, when I was at 14, the lung looked really good, so I'm going to go straight back to 14. But that won't work here. And we'll do that just to have a look. And that's because the lung was atelectatic. And 14 was the best pressure for a recruited lung. This isn't a recruited lung. This is an atelectatic lung. Now, I'll go back to 8 just to show why, because that was to show why you don't do this. We remember, we know what happened. We went up to, what was it, 36? Yeah, it was 36. And, but it was probably at about 32 that we were okay. We were the best, right? Yeah, yeah. We were there and everything was okay. We were there not long ago and the patient tolerated it. So rather than stepwise go back up, we can go straight there, right? This is really fun to do because never do you get to do this normally. Um, but uh, generally the whole ward is watching you going, you're going to go from a mean of 8 to a mean of 25 and not stop in between. And they're all looking at you very suspiciously. Um, so, but we'll go straight up to 32, which is what the protocols will say to do. And we get that immediate lung recruitment that's occurring. It takes experience to trust this. 
So if you're not sure about it, you might just step up in two. But generally, most all the protocols say go up to the one you feel comfortable with as a whole and just go straight there. And you can see that we very quickly get back to where we're at. And now we don't need to step all the way back again. Probably 12, 14 was about the right number here, right? So we can just go straight back there once we've demonstrated the clinical response. So if we were deoxygenating and we go back up to this high mesh and the oxygen improves and we get back to the FO2 and the SATs we were on before when they were good, once we're there, we don't need to stay any longer. We go back to it. We now go to the final pressure. And that's going straight back to 14 and you can see that effect that you have, that you're getting that loss that's occurring as we're going down from the high one, but that uniformity is being retained. And now you watch your baby. And if it's not right, you readjust. As a general rule, when you've got a baby on the oscillator and the baby's not right and you don't know what mean airway pressure to do, I don't do this every time. I would do this every time I've got acute RDS or, or ARDS. But if I've just got a general baby on the oscillator and something's not right and I want to change my mean airway pressure, if in doubt, I'd always go down, not up first because it's much easier to fix atelectasis than over distension right because of the effect on the heart and so forth so if in doubt i would go down if the baby gets better then i know i was over distending the lung and then i'll say i already knew that so and i'm very clever if the baby gets worse i know that probably the baby had atelectasis i've made it work and now i can do this open lung from there so that's why i do it that way so i hope do you have any questions around that No? Yeah, we're... Hold on. No? All want lunch? Maybe after lunch. Okay. Well, have lunch and then uh, we can talk later. Thank you.